Hey everyone, I'm Andre Jimenez. I use he, him pronouns. I am the DEI specialist, the diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist here at the Washington State Historical Society. It's a long title, but essentially my role is to run the diversity and local history grant project here. And this project seeks to increase the stories that we tell and the communities that we serve as heritage organizations. And so today this workshop is for grantees, so organizations that are applying for funding for the next cycle. Um, so just to kind of give you a run of show today, um, I'm gonna go through some quick slides that just talk um, briefly about what DLH is, um, who's eligible, what type of projects we fund. Then towards the end, we will do a walkthrough of the application. Um, I'll show you exactly what the application will look like when you log in. And then we have two amazing grantees from our current cycle who are here. We have the um, someone from the Holocaust Center for Humanity up in Seattle. And then we have the Jefferson County Historical Society also here as well. So towards the end, we'll have a Q&A with both of these organizations to learn more about um, why they applied for this grant funding, the projects that they worked on, and some challenges and successes that they've had during our inaugural cycle. And then at the end, we'll open it up with any remaining time for Q&A. Um, so if you've got questions, please save them and stick around towards the end, and we will try and get all your questions answered. So let me pull up the presentation slides. All righty, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Not face yet, okay. Awesome, okay, so like I said, diversity and local history grant, and this is the workshop for the organizations. So I like to do this up front. Um, this is the contact info for everyone on the Heritage Outreach team. We have um, our director, Jay, here. Um, this is a great screen to take a picture of, to screen grab, because you will need one of these three emails <laughs> as you interact with us in some capacity. Um, and then Allison, who is our Heritage Outreach Manager, she's great for connecting um, small and large heritage orgs alike. And then of course, me as the DEI specialist and the manager of this grant program. Also, again, this is another great um, piece to keep track of, um, washingtonhistory.org. This is our Washington State Historical Society website. If you do backslash DLH, this is the diversity and local history webpage. This is where you will get the most up-to-date information. Um, many of the text from the slides in this workshop can also be found on this website. Um, you can find links to future workshops, to office hours, the timeline, um, and also get onto the portal as well. Also, you can see here, we've updated our grant program guidelines. So um, I see a couple of you applied last cycle. So it might be good to just go through the new guidelines and make sure that you are abreast of all the new information um, and that you're ready to apply. And all that can be found at this one link. So another great thing to screen, screen capture or take a picture on your phone. So just some highlights about the diversity and local history grant program. Um, so it is a state funded program that awards small grants to heritage organizations to fund paid internships to support diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And this was actually born out of a survey that was taken in 2020, where small heritage organizations identified capacity as one of the main barriers that was preventing them from doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So the team here at the time in the Heritage Outreach Department um, spoke with the state legislature and got funding to pay interns to support heritage organizations doing this work. So not only do we think that this work is important, but we think it's important to fund this work. And this grant serves as one vehicle to do that. Um, the proposals that you apply with must support the integration of DEI principles into an organization's operations and promote a long-term focus on inclusive history practices. Now, we recognize here at the Historical Society that DEI work is certainly on a spectrum, that we are all on a journey, that there is no destination in this work. Um, so you do not need to have a um, 
a large history or, or I should say a, a long history of DEI work. Um, if this project serves as kind of the intro for your organization to do that work, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, and then lastly, these grants are open to all heritage organizations in Washington, regardless of an existing track record of commitment to DEI. So uh, wherever you are, um, we want to work with you and we want to help support you in doing this work. Um, this is really important. This is also um, just a screen capture of what's on the website. Um, but just for reference, um, you're here today, May 24th at the grant workshop. Next week, we're going to be having a workshop for um, our academic advisors and our interns. And we'll be walking them through the intern application that is running concurrently with your guys' application. Then starting June 7th, on Tuesdays, we're gonna have weekly office hours from 10 to one. And you can see this join here link. Um, these are Zoom calls that you can just jump in. Um, uh, I and my team will be sitting on here and we'll be able to answer any questions that you have, whether it's trying to log into the portal, whether it's an application question, whether you're wondering about if the scope of your project will be competitive. This is a great time outside of email or phone calls, um, which are perfectly acceptable, to get somebody live and in person to, to help you out and to walk you through the process. Um, uh, really important date here, June 30th, grant applications are due at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That is a hard deadline because we have to get these applications to our review committee so that we can start awarding projects. So then July 20th, um, grant awards will be announced and the descriptions will be posted on the Heritage website. Um, July 21st, we're actually, this is something new for this cycle, we're gonna have a student and intern open house at the Washington State History Museum, where we are gonna be introducing all of your projects to them um, as they start reviewing and um, choosing which projects they want to apply for. Um, then in August, um, grantee contracting will begin. Um, organizations should select their interns by Monday, August 29th, and expect contract execution before October 1st, 2022. So for some of you that applied last cycle, um, this is especially different. Um, we're allowing ourselves about a month, month and a half to do grantee contracting so that people that want to start in September of 2022 will be able to. Um, but again, your start date depends on your project and on your team's capacity. Um, and then June 30th, of course, of 2023 next year, the grant projects need to be completed and final reports submitted. Alrighty, so one of the um, number one questions I get is who is eligible? So eligible applicants include nonprofits, tribal organizations, and um, local government entities in Washington state. Um, Simply, the organizations just need to have a mission to preserve and interpret history and heritage for the general public. Um, that's um, purposefully broad um, because we think that this doesn't just need to be um, history museums. We've had a couple of other heritage organizations um, apply and be successful in this program. So uh, if you have any eligibility questions, please feel free to ask. Um, grantee responsibilities. So the first one is that Organizations must provide a project manager for interns. Um, for this pr um, program to be successful, there really needs to be a great relationship between the project manager, the organization, and the interns. Because while the interns are there to do work for the organization, the interns are also there to learn. And so having somebody that has the time and expertise to guide them through that process is really beneficial. Um, and we'll see a really great example of a great project manager and intern pairing a little later when we hear from some of our current grantees. So just some things that we ask of the project manager is that they have professional training in museum studies, public history, anthropology, you can read the list here, or a related field. Um, that's desired, but not required. Um, and then we do expect you to regularly check in with your interns, guide their work, offer project support and other professional development guidance. Again, this is a learning opportunity for the interns. And so having somebody with the time and expertise to guide into the process is really important. Um, and then, yeah, important to provide a positive educational experience for interns. Um, next is organizations must have funds to pay the interns at $18 an hour, at least twice monthly. Um, 
So this is a reimbursement grant. So grants are distributed on reimbursement and may be requested only upon documentation of payment to interns. So um, you'll show us a timesheet um, and then the pay stub, and then we will reimburse you after the fact. So you do need to have a little bit of cash on hand um, in those interim, but we can turn around payments um, fairly quickly here at the Historical Society. Um, yeah, you do not need to have the full grant amount available, but you should plan to have at least one month's payments for interns on hand throughout the project. Um, and then here's just a sample calculation of one intern at 20 hours per week. Third, and this one is really important um, and probably the one that I spend the most time working with our organizations to define, is projects should have defined goals and clear deliverables. While individual projects must have finite parameters the grant program is designed to support ongoing DEI work within an organization. Proposals should meaningfully contribute to developing inclusive history practices. We do not want interns to be parked at a front desk, to be docents. Um, we really want them to have the ability and capacity to really dig into this work and support um, the onward movement of DEI work in your organization. And then lastly, um, already said it multiple times, but it bears repeating, um, it's important to provide a positive educational experience for interns. And as you'll see um, on the new grantee um, application, we've got some clear um, places where uh, we're making sure that you are um, thinking of the learning objectives and the educational experience of the intern, as well as clearly identifying deliverables at the onset of the project. Next, I got a lot of these types of questions last cycle, and it was pretty amorphous and abstract because we had not had any funded projects. Um, but thankfully, we have had a really successful first cycle um, and so now can offer some more guidance on what types of projects. So um, you'll hear about two types of projects later, um, but our projects have fallen into three categories pretty organically. So we have collections projects where they're looking at a museum's or a historical um, organization's um, collections and, and auditing it, um, outreach or in reach. Um, so they're looking at the communities that they serve and how they can increase those communities and reach uh, marginalized or underrepresented communities. And the last is interpretive. So um, this can be physical exhibits, this can be events, so um, some really great projects and you'll hear from two amazing projects here at the end. But the grant, crit grant criteria broadly um, falls into kind of these four categories. So one, of course, as the diversity and local history grant, uh, it needs to support diversity, equity and inclusion efforts in your organization. So it needs to improve the diversity of the historical narrative and bring DEI concepts and practices into applicant operations. Secondly, it needs to broaden the applicant's organization's audience, contribute to audience diversity, and leverage community engagement. Next, the project logistics. It just needs to be clearly identified um, and have um, very clear and defined deliverables. Um, personnel resources and finances to support the project and intern, which we discussed, and a realistic scope and time frame. Next is future planning. So there needs to be some commitment of the organization's um, mission to DEI work, including future plans, which you'll see a spot for that on the application. And then the project promotes long-term sustainability and stability of the organization. And then lastly, there are some additional considerations that the review committee will be looking at. Um, of course, the geographic distribution of funds as a state agency, we wanna make sure that um, we are utilizing these resources across the state. And then lastly, just the general quality and completeness of the application. So what's the application process? Um, so applications must be submitted through the heritage portal at washingtonhistory.org slash portal, or you can find it on the DLH website um, you must create a login associated with an organization to access the application. And it's important to note that this can take two to three business days to register a new organization. So 
please do not start this application on June 30th at 4.30 <laughs> and think that you're gonna make it through um, the entire application process. Um, I would highly encourage you to um, go and, and register today if you can, um, and just look at the application and um, uh, a lot of successful grantees will pull out the questions and put them into something like a Google Doc, Google Doc or a Word document and then work on it and then go back in and paste in their answers. Um, multiple people can access one organization's profile and application, and applications can be saved and revisited as often as needed. So again, I encourage you to jump in there um, today after this call if you have time, uh, look at the application, walk through it on your own, um, and then ask any questions that you have as it comes up. And then, yeah, so we're just going to take a quick walkthrough of the application. Um, this is going to be especially important for our um, previous um, applicants because um, some of the um, fields have changed. So I'm going to switch over to the portal. So uh, this is what it'll look, it'll look like when you log in. So um, this has all of the grant projects that we have, so diversity and local history, um, and then our heritage capital projects. So um, this one is closed, but you can um, hit click to start DLH grant application. And this is what it looks like. So the first is the request summary. So um, this one is, is really great because you can um, just put in the hours that you need. So if you know that you're requesting 100 hours, it will automatically calculate the total grant amount requested. Um, and then let's say you wanted two interns, should automatically update. There you go. And then. Um, we do ask, will you be paying the intern as an independent contractor or as a staff member? If you click staff, it'll give you a drop down to uh, anticipate the amount of payroll taxes um, that you need to include. Um, and then we just simply ask for a project title and a brief summary of the proposed internship project. Next, we wanna learn more about the organization. So on this organizational profile, uh, we ask um, for the organization here, um, the primary contact, and then an authorized signatory. And this is especially important because this is what we pull when we are creating your contract. So it's uh, really important to make sure that the person has contract signing authority um, from the board. Um, and then we ask you to list the project manager. So the person filling out the application may not be the project manager, and we want it clearly laid out here um, who we need to be contacting um, and who the intern should be contacting um, when they're applying. Um, so primary contact um, title, so title for all three of the people identified here. And then um, we just ask for you to briefly describe the project manager's professional experience and training. Um, again, experience in museum studies, public history, et cetera, is desired, but not required. So um, please just detail um, the experience that the project manager will bring to the team. Um, and then here, list any full-time paid staff that you have, any part-time, and then how many active volunteers do you have? And then this is a new section, and this is just to help us gain um, awareness, or the review committee, I should say, gain awareness of the capacity of your organization. Um, so what is your annual budget? And then we have three collections questions here. So we ask you to please estimate the number of objects in your collection. And we've got some uh, ranges here for you. Um, and then please estimate the number of archival materials in your collection. So photographs, documents, books, et cetera, another set of ranges there. And then optional here, if you know the amount of archival materials in your collection measured in linear feet, you can also list it here. Um, as a non-museum person, this is all foreign language to me, but um, this is especially important as um, we're assessing the um, scope and timeline of some of these projects. Um, it'd be really helpful to know the size of your collections as we're going and reviewing them. Next is intern recruitment. Um, so recruitment point of contact, um, this is normally the project manager, but if it's somebody different, um, then you would just need to designate that here. Um, and then we ask that you um, place a list each name of the individuals from the organization who will be reviewing intern materials in the heritage portal. Next is the DEI background. Um, so like we said, we do not expect a long and extensive track record, but we do want an assessment of where your organization is. Um, 
So we asked, have you adopted a DEI statement? Has your organization engaged in um, comprehensive DEI planning? Staff and volunteers participated in training. Um, and then we leave this open spot for you to summarize any additional DEI work um, that you'd like to make us aware of. Um, and then the project description. Um, one of the most exciting parts of the application um, is, is this a new or existing project? Um, and then, like we said, we really want you to have clear deliverables. Um, so we've designed the application to extract that information um, pretty easily. So we ask you to name your deliverable title. So if you are working on an outreach project and you are you know, creating a DEI statement or you are looking at a um, goal on your strategic plan and how you can um, make sure that goal is aligning to the DEI work that you're doing in other parts of your organization. You would list that here. Then the estimated completion date, and then a detailed description of what the intern would be working on and how we'll measure that. Um, so then we have one deliverable here. Um, if you have more, you would just hit add another deliverable and you'll see another set of drop downs um, open up and you'll just list deliverable number two, and et cetera. This will really help the review committee um, see exactly what your project is and how you'll measure success, um, which is really important as we're making funding decisions. Next is the learning objectives. So again, we wanna make sure that this is a great learning experience for the interns. And so we ask you to just reflect on your project and how it aligns with um, learning objectives. Now, these learning objectives can be found in the grant guidelines um, and are purposefully broad. Um, and so you can um, see the guidelines document for more information on this, or feel free to ask questions. Um, project impacts. So another really important part of the application. Um, describe how your product will improve the diversity of the historical narrative. Um, describe how your proposed products will broaden your organizational audience. Describe how the proposed product will support the long-term sustainability of your organization. And describe your organizational DEI goals and plans beyond the completion of this grant project. So future planning and forward thinking here. Um, some project logistics. Uh, what project, what percentage of this project could be completed remotely? Um, and then describe how comfortable you would be working with an intern who is fully or partially remote. Um, and then how many hours per week are you planning for the interns to be working on this project? So you will have already done some of this work in the project summary at the beginning, um, but you'll just be breaking those total hours into how many um, you can support a week. This is really important to make sure that your staff has the capacity to support the intern um, with whatever amount of hours you choose for this. So be really thinking about how much time can your um, project manager or staff devote to guiding the intern through this process. Um, and then here, what time frame and dates would you prefer? How flexible are you um, on the above logistics information? Um, and then simply, um, if you're awarded a grant, will you have consistent funds to pay? Um, and then is your organization able to provide the local housing for the intern? Um, this is really important for especially those that are in rural parts of Washington or on the east side um, in attracting people um, from, let's say, Seattle um, to come work for your organization. Um, not a requirement, but certainly, um, certainly a benefit if you can offer that. Um, and then lastly, um, are just some documents that the review committee will use to assess, um, assess your organization. So one is just a roster of governing authority members. So fairly simple on a grant or fairly standard on a grant application, um, your organizational chart. Um, and this is if you have 10 plus employees, um, an IRS determination letter, um, this is for nonprofits only, current financial statements, um, your mission, vision, or values. Um, this is again optional. Your diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, if you have one. Um, and then documentation of funds to pay interns and other supporting documents. So this can be um, any supporting documents or images that help convey the work and the scope of the proposed project or your organization's planning capacity. All righty. So we're going to 
stop share. Awesome. And this is the part that I am most excited about. Um, so like I said, um, we are going to hear from two different grantees from our current cycle um, who have been doing really great work in their organizations. Um, so not only will you get to uh, hear about the grant program, see the application um, portal, but you'll also get to hear from people who are currently doing this work and are currently in this program. Um, so first, I would love to um, welcome Devonshire Locke from the Holocaust Center for Humanity to speak about her experience. Um, and I've just got a couple of questions here, Devonshire, to, to guide our conversation. Um, but if there's anything that I leave out or anything that you want to add, please feel free to jump in at any time. So uh, what uh, enticed you or encouraged you to apply, um, I guess it would have been last September, so about nine months ago, um, for this grant project? Hi, everybody. Hi, Andre. Um, that's a great question. So I actually, um, at the time that uh, this grant opportunity came around, our board was loosely discussing starting a DEI committee. And there was one particular board member who was uh, intending to head this committee, uh, but it hadn't been developed yet. And this grant um, was sort of something that came to me and I sent it to our leadership to say, you know, just because uh, our staff might not have the capacity doesn't mean we can't, you know, start this work now. Um, and it was a great opportunity to uh, sort of push that along. And at the same time, our DEI committee started, we had an intern join it, which was awesome to have someone who uh, was not on board or staff and so had a sort of different perspective to add uh, as a student and as someone with different experience than all of us had. So um, it really just came about at a time where our organization wanted to do more, uh, but like you said earlier, was caught up by, well, who's going to do it? And um, how effective will that be if none of us have the time or capacity to really, you know, do it full time? So this was a, a great alternative to that. Yeah. Awesome. And um, I know that you had an amazing intern that you paired with, Erin, um, from the UW Museology program. Um, so what type of work were you working with Erin um, on? Yeah, so Aaron did a number of things for us. Um, we had him start because our organization um, really was new to describing DEI strategies and objectives sort of as they relate to our internal organizational uh, structure and our internally face, you know, facing work. Um, we started Aaron off by getting him familiar with our organization and what our organization does and what um, our staff really cares about. And he did a lot of research on what organizations that are similar to ours are doing in the realm of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And while it's difficult to say there are existing best practices for these things because they're always growing, um, he was doing a lot of research at the start to, um, you know, what are people describing as successful strategies for starting this work? So after doing a lot of that research and sharing it out with our DEI committee, composed of now himself and a few staff members and a couple of board members, um, he then got to work on creating a glossary of terms for our organization. So um, our organization had never actually sat down and had the conversation of what does diversity mean to us? What does equity mean to us? And so what he did was sort of take all that research he had done and formulate it into, well, this is what similar organizations, um, other Holocaust centers, other uh, history museums, this is how they define these terms. And then we actually had a few working sessions with the committee to analyze 
those terms that he put together from research and shape them to be more accurate and aligned with the work that we do. So um, we then had this special glossary of all these terms that matched our work really well. Um, and then he also created a demographic survey that was uh, intended to gather uh, data on what our staff and board look like um, and how folks on our staff and board identify because that had really only been done um, in relationship with grant reporting. So, you know, we didn't have all the information in one place and we weren't intending to collect that regularly to see what growth looks like. And so he created a survey that followed, you know, the most up-to-date best practices on, um, you know, ethical survey taking and things like that. And, uh, he also drafted a DEI statement for our organization, which we uh, reviewed together again, kind of like the glossary. And then I think uh, most excitingly, he did some research on finding our organization a uh, potential DEI tr uh, training consultant. So our staff and board have not done DEI training before, and he researched a few consultants that might align with the work that we do the best. And we interviewed them together as a committee and we decided on one and are currently in contract negotiations with a consultant, which is fantastic. So that will happen down the road um, because as you can imagine, these consultants are very busy. And, um, but he was the one that did the research, put notes together and started these interviews with these folks um, and helped us choose one person that we think will train our board and staff in a really understanding way. Um, and then, yeah, he started working on a task list of where we're going to go with uh, all this information we have next. So that's something that our DEI uh, committee is still working through and building on. Um, but he really set us up with a great foundation. So it was it was fantastic. Awesome. And um, just for the the people watching um holocaust was one of our um outreach um or was grouped in one of our outreach projects um and they titled their project something really interesting that i had never heard of but it makes total sense um it was really a dei in reach strategy um so so oftentimes you know we think of outreach we want to get more people inside of our organizations right um but i think that holocaust was a really interesting project and and did really well because it was so focused on making sure that the organization was healthy and had a firm foundation on these DEI core principles before starting to do the outreach work. And I think that once they start doing that outreach work, they're gonna be so much better for it. Um, and, and so just one more question, um, Devonshire, what were some of the challenges you experienced and then some of the successes and what would you tell future grantees who are going through this process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, one of the, I think, main challenges we ran into was um, simply the fact that this kind of work takes a lot of time. And our intern was really, really speedy, really efficient, really organized. And so, um, you know, it was difficult for us to find things for him to do that wasn't getting ahead of where the organization was ready to be. Um, if that makes any sense. He um, did a lot of research really fast. As you can imagine, grad students, you know, they're, they're in the zone, they are reading fast, they're um, absorbing information really quickly um, through practice. And uh, he was one of those people and also had a lot of experience under his belt doing this kind of work for different organizations. Uh, and that was just an experience that he happened to have. So he moved really quickly and it was difficult for uh, the committee to say, well, let's slow down. Let's reflect on this a little bit more because he wanted to continue this work and he was really excited by it. Um, so that was a challenge uh, simply because, you know, as someone watching him do this work really well, but also someone that has extensive knowledge of our, the capacity of our organization. It was difficult to have to slow him down a little bit. Um, although in the times that we did, and we had discussions within the committee about, let's think about this a little more and what this means. Those were some of the best discussions um, 
and unexpected discussions that really helped us reflect on our organization and what we want. So in those moments where we were, you know, had to force all of ourselves to, to curb the excitement and slow down a little bit, we had some great, great discussions. So um, that was one challenge. Uh, in terms of what went really well, um, I think we also uh, just a timing thing, we happened to have just recreated our or drafted our strategic plan as an organization. And so this was a really great opportunity where we can, we, uh, Aaron and myself and the committee um, took a lot of these ideas that we had about uh, DEI strategies and um, not just internally faced strategies, but oh, how are we gonna apply this to the work we do for students, for teachers? Um, we were able to use the strategic plan as a way of making sure every idea, every next step, every task um, is really aligned with what we were doing and what we wanted to see in our organization's growth in the next three years. So having that strategic plan and doing the work alongside that, the DEI work alongside that really helped keep everything tight and aligned and um, feel important and relevant to what we were doing. So that was great because sometimes I think it's hard to get everyone in an organization on the same page about why, why do uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work? Why take on these difficult and timely um, strategies? Um, you know, and this really helped us answer that question. Why? Because we set this out as a goal in our strategic plan. So yeah, that was really great something that came about of it. Awesome. And then any um, final words or words of encouragement for future grantees who are either here or going to be watching this in the future? Yeah, I think um, what worked really well for us in communication with our intern was just being really honest and transparent about um, the challenges that our organization was going through and differences of, you know, where people are at, even within the organization on this journey, how comfortable people are with talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that honesty really helped our intern learn, you know, as someone who is wanting to, to work in this field, but had little experience with museums, sort of learn what it's like to be in an organization where, um, you know, these things can be really challenging and we want to navigate them with care and attention and intention. Um, and so I think that transparency really helped him learn and uh, feel like he understood the challenges and, uh, you know, learn more about what it's like to work in this sort of environment. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Devonshire. Yeah. I think that that's important for um, any any organization doing any type of work, but especially doing this DI work, just make sure that you're being transparent and honest with ourselves and with others about where we are in this work and the capacity. Um, so I, I definitely think organizations should reflect on that as they're gearing up to apply for this. Um, but thank you so much. It has been uh, so great working with you during this cycle, and I, I can't wait for our paths to cross again. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, now let's move on to um, our next grantee. Um, and I'm really excited because this grantee brought along one of their interns. Um, so we'll get to hear kind of that dual perspective of both the organization and the intern side. So I would love to, uh, I, I was gonna say welcome to the mic, but <laughs> you can unmute yourself and get, grab a mic anytime. Um, but I, I have Ellie here from the Jefferson County Historical Society, and I saw their intern Hunter also enter into the space. Um, and so uh, welcome to you both. Um, and I guess just as the first question, uh, why did you apply to the Diversity and Local History Grant Program, um, both as an organization and an intern? Thank you, Andrea. I can kick that off. Um, so for the Historical Society, and, and for those who aren't sure where Jefferson County is, we're out on the Olympic Peninsula, Port Townsend, um, Port Ludlow, uh, Port Hadlock, Quilcene, all the way out to Claylock. Pretty big county, pretty diverse um, geographically, um, but 
as an organization, what we were really interested in understanding was how diverse our collection was and what we were doing. Um, we got a new executive director in 2018 and we did a strategic plan that um, was approved by the board in March of 2020. And uh, as part of that, we really wanted to look internally on who is being represented in our museum and our collections and all of the work that we do. Um, how are they being represented? Are, are the people that are being represented representing themselves um, or are they being represented by other groups of people and um, what is our role in that so this opportunity was really exciting for us to look internally at our collection um, which is kind of scary to turn the mirror in on yourself that way and also really exciting to to see what we suspected um, and to use that as motivation to continue to do better um, in our community and with our community. Awesome, and then maybe if we can um, give Hunter a chance to kind of talk about why you decided to apply as an intern um, this past fall. Yeah, so um, I graduated not too long ago, and so I kind of, with, with a, uh, a degree in history so I kind of just wanted to actually do something with that but um, I've always been kind of interested in, um, in social history and kind of like the uh, social dynamics throughout history and this look at this just it was a great opportunity for me to kind of hone my skills as far as a social historian goes with um, with understanding kind of representation and, and um, and whatnot throughout history, as well as um, as well as currently, and this this was a great opportunity to both get myself stuck into museums and also um, also learn a lot about uh, what I <laughs> may have been falling short in as far as diversity and e equity is concerned. Yeah, that's what this grant program's about. So Ellie, can you describe, um, I know that you are one of our amazing collections based products or products, projects. <laughs> um, so can you talk about the work that um, your team and Hunter did over the last several months uh, in relation to this project? Absolutely. Um, so collections can be a little bit scary to think about who who is represented in the collection, who is representing them and how are they represented? And how do you get to the heart of that? Because there's so many different parts of that process that can impact what you are seeing when you're a collections um, manager or working with collection. Um, we really wanted to get a broad understanding of our collection. Uh, we have, we estimate about half a million objects. So that, that's way more than you can look at individually, um, I think. Uh, our heads would probably explode if we tried to do that for each and every object. So um, we really needed to look at things that we suspected or knew in our collection um, with a careful eye and um, patterns, identifying patterns and the way that things were cataloged or how things came into our collection. Um, so this has been a, a really iterative process. We weren't sure what we would see because we haven't done one of these um, measurements or, or baselines for uh, who's in our collection. Um, and so we really need to, needed to understand that. And uh, part of that process is um, we had a few key objects that anecdotally our team knew needed to be reviewed and looked at. And so we looked at those and talked through them and, and they can be very challenging. I think anybody who's seen some um, frankly very racist things that can exist in your collection, it can be um, very challenging to go through those and also understand why people may have cataloged in the way that they did to obfuscate um, or inadvertently obfuscate some of the, the truth um, of who is representing whom um, in those collections. And so for this process, it was really understanding the way that we had tagged things in our collection as a starting place. So what were the search terms that were being used? And then what are groups that we could look at in more detail rather than trying to start with 
object one, then moving through um, half a million things. Let's pull together groups and look at um, each of those individually. It's going to be a very long process for us. Our goal is um, by 2024, the end of, we want to have collecting plans to help us uh, fill out our collection to better represent our community. Anecdotally, we knew that a lot of wealthy white people had donated to our collection, and we didn't have a collecting uh, policy. We're sort of more of a passive collecting organization, which means that people who feel represented really well tend to continue to donate to our collection and are overrepresented in our collection. A lot of that is wealthy white men um, and sometimes their wives. Um, and now, through this process and as we evaluate things a little more closely, we can identify um, where we may have those really large gaps um, and try to work, if future work, this wasn't part of the work that Hunter was helping us with, but future work will be reaching out to, for example, the Asian American community here to better understand how they would like to be represented uh, by the historical society and um, how we can work with them to do that. Awesome. No, it, it's it's such important work, right? Because, you know, collections are the foundation of a museum, of, of a historical society. And, you know, when we're talking about increasing the stories that we tell, that has to start and include our collections, you know, and that is how we'll increase the communities that we serve, right? And, and you spoke to both of those really well. So um, thank you. And as just kind of a final question, and um, this can go to Hunter or Ellie, um, what were some of the challenges that you experienced? You, you kind of started to speak to some of the challenges in looking at half a million objects and <laughs> you know where, where to start. Um, so what are some challenges, successes, and then um, leave off with any recommendations or words of encouragement for future grantees? I can kick that off with a couple challenges. Um, I think one of the challenges is figuring out what you can do remotely with a collection versus in person and how to be really effective in that work. Um, so much of what we have is on paper in filing cabinets. It's, it's not just what's in the catalog record. Um, so I could see that being a challenge for some people who are thinking about projects like these themselves. We were able to strike, a, a I think, a pretty good balance with some in-person and some remote. Um, and same with some of the other opportunities we were able to do. Um, I would say lots of successes. The um, inventories that Hunter started with, some of them I've read through that I'm like, I can't believe we had this. Oh my gosh, where is this coming from? Oh, this is a really interesting thing. We need to find that. Um, and also another success that we had were some objects that um, I wasn't sure that we had in our collection anymore because they had been listed as missing were actually found as part of this process, which wasn't expecting that. And now we are reaching out to the tribal organization that we would like to send them back to, um, to uh, they shouldn't be owned by us. They need to go back to their appropriate home. So that was a major success. I think a, a major challenge, I'm guessing Hunter is going to also second this, is sometimes it can be a real bummer to look at a lot of really bad stuff all day long. Um, so making sure to break it up and say, OK, doing this evaluation for this, it is sometimes it's just really hard to look at the same stuff um, that you wish people had done better in the past. And um, so having different types of projects where you can balance some of that emotional and mental um, need to not be seeing that is really important. Hunter, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, um, as far as challenges, I would absolutely second that. Uh, the amount of kind of just casual racism is, is quite uh, eroding, you know, it, it's, it gets to you a little bit, but um, yeah, other than that though, it's just, yeah, I don't know any other challenges that I faced besides that, because uh, we did strike such a great balance between um, kind of remote work and, and coming into, into the collections, so. I think I do have one piece of advice with a project like this, which is to be iterative and to do a test with a small group 
and then revise your process and continue to do that. Um, that was something that we've done on this project that I think is really successful. And if we had, if we had just like started with, okay, we're going to write out everything, you know, and set it in stone and then start, I think we would be less successful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellie. And I, I think that your team is just such a, a really strong example of why um, organizations need to carefully select their project manager to help guide the interns through this process. Um, because as you both identified, you know, doing this type of collections work, a collections audit is very difficult work, especially when you're adding in these DEI lenses. And, you know, as Hunter mentioned, you know, the casual racism can be eroding. Um, and, and it's really important that um, your project manager has the ability to see that, to understand it, and to help the help guide the intern through that. And I, I think that your team was just a, a really shining example of uh, what a project manager should be and um, how an intern should work um, on this project. So, um, so, so grateful to have you guys as part of um, this first cycle. Um, and with that, we've got about um, seven or eight minutes left. I would love to open up the floor to any questions that some prospective grantees have, um, whether for um, me here, um, Jay, my comrade here at the Historical Society, or maybe for one of the um, current grantees. So if anybody wants to unmute or put a question in the chat, now is the time. Or if you just want to introduce yourself and say hi, that's completely acceptable as well. <laughs> There's some new names in, in here. And it's always good to see Greg down in Olympia. <laughs> How are you, Greg? Thank you, and likewise, Andrew. Um, well, I should change my, my background. Um, well, I, I would first want to say, Andre, this has been very helpful, and I also appreciate um, the input from um, Ellie and Devonshire and, and Hunter. It was very, very helpful. Um, uh, so thank you for that. And I, I guess my, my questions that, that I have a lot of questions, but I think I'd sort of like to focus on um, kind of more of the logistics of, of those of those relationships that you had. And first of all, um, um, if, if Devonshire or Ellie could maybe talk a little bit about the time that, um, that you found yourself devoting to, um, to the project and to your interns. Could you characterize that for, for me, just sort of um, you know, in terms of the time devotion dedicated to that? I can start. Um, so my intern or our intern uh, and I checked in with each other once a week. And sometimes this was a 30 minute check in and sometimes it was closer to an hour and a half um, because there's so much uh, that this work you know, brings up and so much conversation to be had around these things uh, and the challenges that uh, you sort of navigate. Uh, and then additionally, we uh, also met with our DEI committee every other week. So that was an additional about hour of meeting time where Aaron got to share what he was working on with the committee and the committee sort of determined uh, how much conversation and reflection we wanted to have uh, around those deliverables and around that work made suggestions, answered questions about the org. Uh, so in terms of meeting times, I would say about an hour and a half uh, to two hours a week. Uh, and then I also uh, prepared, you know, some avenues for Aaron to pursue when he first joined on in terms of research. Um, and that maybe took another two hours or so to get Aaron all set up with things uh, he needed to know about our organization and uh, start him off with some avenues uh, to pursue research if he got stuck, um, which he didn't. He was very equipped uh, to do that. But 
I didn't want him to feel like he was being thrown into something without direction. So a little bit of prep work and regular meeting, I think helped us out a lot. Great, thank you. And then I can answer for the collections related. Um, I tend to be a very hands-on trainer. I think that people can be so much more successful when you really support them the first time that they're doing something and you check in with them the second time that they're doing something and continue to support them in that way. And so there were some moments where I think um, our original application was for about 20 hours a week. So quite a bit of time um, for Hunter. And there were some weeks where I spent probably uh, six to 10 hours working with him directly. And then there are other weeks where it's um, a little bit less. It's maybe two hours at a time, depending on the project. And that has to do with some of the things I know that are in our collection and also that I know um, will help him understand what is in our collection or the work that we're doing, uh, context that he, I knew that he may not have because he has a history background rather than specific to museums. Um, so I think there's a little bit of evaluation there that you may need to do with the, the person that you have in your individual project. Great, thank you, Ellie. Can I ask real quickly, Devonshire, um, um, can you tell me, what, was there any kind of, um, in terms of getting your, your DEI, DEI committee or your board members, was there any kind of um, process or work that you had to vote to getting, getting them together on this, getting them on board um, and working with your intern? Was, that, was there any kind of challenges involved with that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, I think one major challenge that existed from the start was uh, the idea and our, our board member who um, was on our DEI committee knew this as well, um, that he, um, this particular board member was sort of speaking for a group of board members who were all over the map in terms of how much they understood the importance of DEI work. So. Um, this this board member in particular sort of had to always be considering you know how will this be uh, approached or reflected on at different levels by different people how comfortable are our different board members going to be with the idea of dei training um and so in order to assist with that or or aid our board member with communicating what our committee and what our intern was doing to the rest of the board um it really helped that Aaron was a fantastic communicator himself and sort of could advocate for himself about why these things were important for him, um, never mind for our organization. And uh, again, like I said, that challenge of him wanting to move faster than our organization was ready to do, I think meeting with our DEI committee regularly helped uh, with that in terms of us uh, really you know, asking all the questions we think other staff members or other board members might have, whether we have those questions or not, um, and really making sure that every movement forward was an, an intentional step and a step that um, felt, you know, necessary and uh, that people were on the same page through every step of the process. So um, that's a big challenge, but I think also, you know, as a student, you are looking at, and as someone who was a student recently myself, you're looking at these opportunities as a learning experience um, and you don't necessarily have to take on uh, all the all the barriers that an organization faces yourself and internalize that. So he was able to see things from a perspective um, that maybe felt more or less burdensome or less um, uh, resistant um, because as someone who's actually outside the organization and there to learn. Uh, so I think combining that with the, the slower pace of the organization made for a great conversation dynamic. Like what would we do ideally? What can we do? And where can we find a place in the middle that's pushing ourselves but not beyond capacity? So it gave, yeah, it gave a really nice balance. Okay, thank you very much. Awesome, and we are currently at 11.01. Um, so 
Um, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'm going to put my um, email in the chat. Um, please, if you have any additional questions, do not hesitate to reach out via email um, and we can set up a time to, to speak offline or um, feel free to utilize the office hours starting June 7th. So every Tuesday from 10 to one, I will be on here on Zoom, ready to answer any questions that you have. Um, so with that, um, thank you all for coming to our grantee workshop. Um, and one last time, if you have any, um, any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you again to our presenters, Devin Shire from Holocaust Center for Humanity up in Seattle, and for Elian Hunter representing Jefferson County's Historical Society. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday.